Hi everyone, I'm here today with a short review of Red at the Bone by Jacqueline Woodson. Woodson is pretty famous, so I've been meaning to read some stuff by her for a while. I actually thought this was the first thing I'd ever read by her, but then all the references in the book to Brooklyn, where much of the story is set, made me realize about an hour of the way in that I actually have read another one by her. And that one was Another Brooklyn, which I read a few years ago, but I didn't fully digest it and reflect on it enough at the time as I would have liked to so I might go back and read that one again eventually. This book too is one that I enjoyed for what it was, but it's also the kind of book where you really have to think beyond what's just on the page. The book has great value for the thoughts it provokes and the discussions it generates. It feels like a very studyable book in that sense. Um, a good book for a book club conversation, but also one that I think if you just read it and take it at face value without engaging in further reflection and the broader conversations around it, it'll be harder to get as much out of it. I thought at first when I started this that it was going to be a young adult novel because Woodson has written some of those, but it really isn't. I think it would still be age appropriate for mature teens to read it, but speaking for myself at least, I feel like I just wouldn't have gotten as much out of this book as a teenager because a lot of the themes in it will just require more life experience to find really relatable. It's quite a short book which makes it a quicker read than most stuff out there. The audiobook was under four hours. But for the reasons I've already mentioned, it's the kind of book that really will require your attention if you want to appreciate it, and not one that you can just listen to in the background at double speed while doing whatever it is that you do as you listen to books. I do highly recommend listening to this one if you can, uh, because each of, I think, five different characters uh, is voiced by his or her own narrator, uh, with some additional third-person sections read by Woodson herself. So in this book, we follow several family members belonging to several coexisting generations of a black family centered in Brooklyn, New York, but occasionally occupying other environments too. I've heard some reviewers describe it as a book about teen pregnancy, and well, it is and it isn't. This book is not first and foremost about a teen pregnancy. That is the primary event that shapes the narratives of the book and the overall unifying thread, but it's not a driving plot point or something that takes up the entirety of the book because this book is really more character driven and it jumps frequently from one point in time to another. Although Woodson does focus on the experience of the pregnancy itself and how it affected the parents, more than that, she shows how this event and the eventual arrival of baby Melody shaped everyone in the family, and not just the parents Iris and Aubrey, but their grandparents as well. And thus, this book is really about many things. One reviewer pointed out how it's all about love, uh, all about the different kinds of love that there are, including familial love, romantic love, sexual love and attraction, and even different types within all of those. It's also about how our life, whether we like it or not, really is never totally our own, and how others' decisions will affect us in ways that are not particularly fair, but also, good or bad, these consequences are inescapable. We're shaped by history, too. There are historical events arising throughout the narrative and affecting the main characters, which I didn't always completely love, but were at least all done in a way that amplified our understanding of who the characters became. And the characters were one shining light within this book. I liked that the characters were all just very human and didn't fall into the often pigeonholed roles that we expect them to fall into. For example, many of the reviews that I watched pointed out how interesting it is that in this book, instead of a girl becoming pregnant in high school and the father jumping ship and leaving the mother to take care of the child all by herself, here it's the father who's the one who effectively ends up raising the child when the mother, who's afraid to just commit to this relationship forever, heads off to college, leaving the baby behind with her father and with the baby's grandparents on both sides of the family. Now it may sound from this description pretty clear then who are the good guys and the bad guys in the book, who's in the right and who's in the wrong, but that's only because I'm oversimplifying it. The characters in this story aren't easy to judge. Every character is both lovable and relatable, uh, but will also make decisions that some readers will find frustrating. I was going to say baffling there, but the beauty is that as they're written, these characters' actions never really are totally baffling to us because we can understand their motivations even when we disagree with the exact choices that they make. I absolutely loved the chapters with the grandparents. Both the grandfather and the grandmother on Iris's side were two characters who had a lifetime full of interesting experiences, including a shared experience where they got a granddaughter much earlier than they expected or wanted but not only learn to deal with it, but also really appreciate this little surprise that life dished out to them. In fact, the first monologue with a grandfather who's called Po'boy, uh, talking to himself as he looks after his young granddaughter, was hands down my favorite scene in this book. The mood of this book also really stood out to me, and it's probably one of the things I'll remember the most about it. Part of it was likely the way that it was powerfully narrated by several different narrators in the audiobook version that I listened to. 
The narrative also just really conveyed the sense of feeling utterly lost in the world. Like when Iris realized she's pregnant in high school, but she hasn't even figured out who she is herself yet, never mind being ready to raise a child to be her own person. So there's this sense of feeling lost and powerless, and yet somehow still feeling profoundly hopeful. It's this paradox where we come to realize there are so many things completely out of our control and that life doesn't follow the plan we laid out for it. But instead of being steamrolled by this terrifying realization, we learn to live with it and maybe we even discover that it means life also brings us joys we never hoped for or expected. But th that's just what it was for me. And to try to capture the mood or the essence of this book feels for this book almost like a disservice. So if this has piqued your interest, maybe you should go ahead and check it out for yourself. I enjoyed this book, but honestly, it's not an easy read in spite of its short length. It's not one that I'd call gripping or one that keeps you glued to the page, and yet it is one that moved me, especially in its best moments. If you're interested in reading it, I encourage you to approach it in a time when you're feeling open-minded to it and just give it a chance, because I think this book would be most appreciated if you give it time to sink in. I'm already finding myself that I'm kind of enjoying it more now that I'm finished with it and looking back on it than I realized I would when I was listening to it. So that's all I have to say about Red at the Bone by Jacqueline Woodson. If you want to hear more about this book, I encourage you to check out what other YouTube reviewers have to say. I sure learned a lot from others myself, and I've linked several of my favorite reviews below in the description, including an interview with the author herself that I appreciated. And to hear more weekly reviews on a whole variety of different books, like this video, subscribe, and stay tuned. Bye, and happy reading.